I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to watch is a presentation from Tech Field Day Live at NetApp Insight. Tech Field Day is an event where we bring independent writers, speakers, bloggers, podcasters together with companies in their space to ask questions, interact, discuss, and of course, to learn about new technology. If you'd like to learn more, you can come to techfieldday.com and you can see a lot of videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Thanks for watching. So this is a presentation uh, that, like Steven said, was originally done in May of 2014. And I think the shocking part is how well it's held up. Uh, this is normally a 90 minute presentation. We have for Insight uh, crammed it into a 60 minute slot. And for the Tech Field Day folks, we're gonna cram that into a 45 minute slot. So we're gonna plow through here. The good news is we're not gonna have to do a bunch of the basics, but I think where we need to start with is the disclaimer, right? The first is that all of this is based on publicly available sources, right? If there is something wrong in the presentation, I either read it wrong when doing the research or the research that we did, the publicly available information that we got didn't have it correct in there. Uh, if there's anything in here that you see that isn't accurate, please feel free to follow up with me and we'll make sure to change it. This isn't designed to say that any architecture is better than any other architecture. There are no right or wrong answers when it comes to putting together an all-flash array. This is merely to show the trade-offs and the compromises that have to be made as you go through and make the architectural decisions of building a, pro of building a product. We're not gonna cover every all-flash architecture. The three that we prim uh, primarily focus on are gonna be solid fire, pure and extreme IO, because those three really cover the breadth of the different types of architectures that are available and have some really interesting uh, different choices that they made in those. The bias here, I would hope, is very explicit. NetApp is very happy with the solid fire architecture for the markets and for the customers that we're targeting. Um, we're not, this isn't necessarily a competitive presentation, but I get paid by one of the three vendors that we're talking about here today. So just as a disclaimer, we put that up front there. Uh, when we launched this session in 2014, this was the first slide uh, that Dave Wright put up. And when we looked at these three different categories, which still exist, right, we still have flash appliances. Uh, they are smaller and they are more niche focused today than they were. We still have dual controller arrays that have been retrofit either into a hybrid configuration or an all flash configuration. And we still have from the ground up flash architectures. What's been really interesting is the movement of the vendors underneath it. If we look at the flash appliances, uh, of the four that we originally called out in this presentation, only one of them is still alive and that one just barely. Like we've support. Right, so we have still see violin, but IBM took over Texas Memory Systems. We've got Hitachi in there. Uh, Cisco took over and then did away with Whiptail in the space of the last two years. When we look at the middle tier, when we look at those traditional arrays that have been upfit into the flash space, we've got lots of consolidation, right? 3PAR is now HP, Hitachi moved in, Dell Technologies has rolled up all of the Dell and EMC. Um, you know, NetApp is still the same NetApp that, it, that they've always been. I mean, they're kind of the constant in that, that middle section. And then in the all flash arrays, right? Solid Fire obviously got acquired by NetApp in February of this year. Dell Technologies rolled up the Extreme IO platform. Uh, Pure Storage is still in the same spot that they were, and really one of the new and interesting entries into that scale-out node-based all-flash uh, environment is uh, VMware. Uh, the vSAN product is certainly an interesting architectural collection of choices, and uh, one of the things that we're going to do as a follow-up to this presentation is really start to focus more on those hyper-converged storage platforms and look at the, uh, at the architectural choices that they've made. So we as a standalone company made some pretty strong comments around why it's inappropriate to adapt a traditional architecture for all flash. Um, and I think that those were based in sound fact. I think we, uh, as a general rule, maybe overstated exactly how difficult it would be in order to take a dual controller array and be able to retrofit those in there. So the three things we targeted were that adding data reduction and complex metadata handling is really difficult, that dealing with flashware and write amplification in a traditional array environment is uh, difficult to do, and then the fact that a dual controller storage array is its own bottleneck. Right, that the dual controllers become the bottleneck there. When we look at these, you're adding data reduction is difficult. If you don't build it from the ground up, the metadata handling is a different beast for almost every storage array that's out there. But the file system that sits 
natively to the array matters a lot here. And it's really fun to sit next to Dave Hitz, and I think we actually had this conversation at one of the Storage Field Day events, where Dave stands up and says, I didn't build Waffle for Flash, but damn if it doesn't work really well. Right? If that file system ends up doing a lot of the things that have to be built from the ground up in a file system today in order to be able to handle the metadata load and to be able to handle the metadata tracking and the queuing and all the things that need to go into that. Plus, we've seen lots of disk architectures start to add those metadata handling features. Not always completely, not always at scale, but being able to do dedupe and compression, whether it's inline or post-process, is something that almost every dual controller architecture has been able to do at this point. Dealing with Flashware, uh, this is a pretty straightforward binary choice. Either you build the array from the ground up to be able to understand how it is you have to lay data down onto Flash, or you use really expensive Flash. And the thing is, these aren't mutually exclusive. There are architectures, and we'll talk about one of them, that are built from the ground up that still use expensive over-provisioned storage in order to be able to offload system functions onto the disks. This isn't a necessarily right choice or wrong choice, but you must do one or the other. You can't take a traditional um, data layout and put it into an SSD environment with commercial uh, MLC drives and have that work well for long, especially from a driveware standpoint. Yeah, but as long as it doesn't show up in the selling price, I don't care that, they ha that the vendor has to spend more for their SSDs. Especially as long as those SSDs are guaranteed against wear for the life of the, the support life of the product, absolutely. And then the third one is that the controllers are a bottleneck. And yes, we know that there's a limit to the dual controller architecture, but that performance gets better every time Intel graces us with yet another CPU platform. Right, I think if there's not a storage company that's sending Christmas cards to Intel at this point, uh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're missing the boat there. Uh, second is that for the workloads that most dual controller arrays are targeting, which is single workload or small number of workloads, the bottleneck is more than enough to be able to handle them. Right? We can't do large scale consolidation into, a, in, into this type of architecture, but we can certainly bring down workloads that we need to accelerate or workloads that we need to make faster. And lastly, we don't see a whole lot of customers that are capped or that are being limited by the amount of IOPS that they can push out of these arrays to begin with, especially yeah, for a small number of- 300,000 IOPS, it's still exactly. 300,000 IOPS. It's 300,000 IOPS and you're putting one or two, maybe three applications on it. You've got more than enough I.O. to be able to handle whatever sort of noise you're going to generate out of those three applications, right? So yes, it's a bottleneck. Is it a bottleneck for a small deployment or for a small number of workloads? Probably not. So we're going to look at these six things, and we're going to move through them pretty quickly, but we're going to set up what's the question that we're asking, and then we're going to look at the architectural choices that are made. I believe there's only one of these six where all three vendors made a different choice on how it was that they were going to implement it. In most cases, there will be a choice that was made that's really dependent on the architecture that was put in place. So the first one we'll look at is system scale. How do we scale capacity and performance within the environment? This is really a choice of scale up or scale out. Pure uses a you know, traditional block array scale up approach. The performance is scaled by the controllers. The capacity is scaled by the shelves. If I want to add more capacity into a scale up array, I add more shelves into it. If I want to add more performance into an array, I replace the controllers. Right. Most of the smart vendors, Pure is definitely one of those, has built the refresh of the controllers into the support cost of the array. Right? They're trying to take something that could be perceived as a limitation, that being I've got four different controller models and all of them have a different level of performance and if you want to move from one level to the other you have to replace the controllers and are including it as part of the support cost so that every three years you get whatever version of CPU is now in the new version of that level of controller. Yeah, they'll also sell you the bigger controllers at just the cost difference. Difference between so them. So they're doing a good job of, of using financial engineering to ameliorate Absolutely. Limitation. Absolutely. It doesn't change the fact that you still have to have somebody with their hands inside a controller. It doesn't change the fact that you've still got at some point to do the maintenance in order to be able to do that. But the financial hit of land a new array on the floor and migrate all the data from one to the other largely gets taken off the table. Right? So the, the operational impact of that versus the architectural impact of that, it's amazing what a little bit of sales and marketing can do. Right? Um, when we look at how this scales out, we add more capacity, we're not adding more performance as we go. This is straightforward. I imagine that every storage admin on the planet has operated inside <coughs> this environment at some point in time. 
SolidFire and Extreme I.O. use a model where you can scale the capacity and the performance separately. Extreme I.O. calls these X-bricks, SolidFire calls these nodes, but each node owns the storage that's in it, and we have the ability to add more performance and capacity as we go. In the case of SolidFire, that scale is not just linear, meaning we don't have to just add nodes of the same size. We can add nodes of different sizes so that the ratio between the performance and the capacity can be adjusted over time as we see the workloads that are coming in particularly environments where we don't know what the next workload's gonna be. What acquisition are we doing? What's coming out of test dev and into prod? Having the ability to adjust that ratio over time becomes one of the selling points. It also means that customers can take advantage of newer nodes, <coughs> bigger disks, more density, more, lower price per gig as they go rather than being locked into one frame. Uh, it also gives us the ability, in the case of SolidFire, to load balance from a performance bandwidth um, and capacity standpoint across the nodes so that any node failure has a nice distributed load to be able to recover from. When we add these nodes in, we're adding performance and capacity works roughly the same way on the solid fire side as it would on, would on the extreme IO side. When we look at these in balance, what we see is that scale up tends to be better for smaller fixed predictable workloads. I need an array that can do this much and I'm gonna buy this much and I know the workloads that I'm gonna put in there and that's well within the envelope of what it is that I'm buying. Um, there's no downgrade option, the, the scaling options are, are large chunks, we have to buy new controllers, we have to buy a new, uh, new array to be able to get that performance. On the scale outside, the performance remains balanced, we have the ability to add performance and capacity separately. This tends to be better for large scale, unpredictable growth, uh, provides us more flexibility in how small we can scale and what we can do with resources after they've been put into a cluster. Once we talk about the scale side, now we talk about system redundancy. How are we going to provide high availability? How are we gonna protect the data that gets put onto the array? Pure and extreme I.O. here use a method that is very uh, matched to the architecture that they're using. So we've got, again, a redundant set of controllers that share the same set of disks via shelves with some sort of interconnect between them. Um, on a disk failure, each of these vendors is using a RAID stripe that matches to the shelf so that if we lose a disk, we're going to rebuild that disk either to spares or to the existing excess capacity within the shelf. And on a controller failure, the remaining controller is sized to be able to handle the entire load. Again, fairly traditional block architecture. Again, would be surprised if anybody's not familiar with how this works out. On shelf failure, we do have a single point of failure. Now, in my entire career, I've seen a grand total of one shelf failure. So this is not something that is necessarily top of mind for customers. However, understanding that that is a single point of failure, and depending on the architecture, depending on whether data is written just to a shelf or whether a data is written randomly across all of the shelves, you're going to have different levels of impact to whether that's just localized data unavailability or whether that's global cluster data unavailability until that comes back up and working. And Extreme IO just doesn't have the scale to do <coughs> cross shelf raid kind of stuff. Right. Well, and, and when we talk about data placement, we'll see why they're very happy with doing it a shelf at a time as well. On the solid fire side, we use a shared nothing node-based approach. In this case, it's used almost exclusively for large scale out environments. In this case, there's no sharing of any hardware component. The only interconnect is the sig signaling and networking between the nodes. Every node runs its own version of, the, of the, uh, the storage OS. Every version owns its own storage that is local. Redundancy between the nodes is based on the network and on disk failure, every disk in the cluster the mesh network between them is used to reprotect the data that was on that disk. So the larger the cluster gets, the more disks that are in the cluster, the faster that rebuild process is gonna be. On a controller failure or a node failure, that mesh rebuild happens in the exact same, uh, the exact same way into the available capacity uh, on the cluster itself. So there's no concept of what data can be seen from what controller, there's no um, awareness of we need to protect within a certain node. All of the data protection happens across all of the nodes at the same time. The more nodes you have, the more disks you have, the faster that mesh rebuild process works. When we look at these, shared disk is great for small starting capacities. Right? I don't have to have four controllers. I don't have to have a large platform, I can only use two controllers in there. Um, I think the interesting part here is the third bullet, 
right? So on a shared disk environment, I have less capacity <laughs> overhead. RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID DP, these should absolutely use less capacity in order to provide the data protection. But there is more controller overhead because my controller head is always going to be 50% of my available controllers. On the shared nothing side, we have more capacity overhead. In the case of Solid Fire, there are two copies of every blocks. I had someone in a tech deep dive session yesterday say, what does that mean to my overhead? I said, divide it by two. <laughs> right, so there are two and only two copies of every block, but my controller overhead is going to go down as the number of controllers in the cluster increases. So if I have a 10 node cluster, my controller overhead is one tenth of the hardware that I have inside the array. These aren't right or wrong, it's just where do you want that starting point to be and what are you looking for from a feature set standpoint out of the cluster itself? Yeah, I, I could argue that with two copies you have a lower level of resiliency than in a RAID 6 system. Sure, and we could argue the difference between allowing multiple failures with impact or protecting against total time at risk on the array. I mean, again, they're just philosophical discussions about which, yeah, we're, which we're, type we're, do we we're want We're at to. the line yep. where it's like, do I care? It's yes. like, yeah, sometimes I do and sometimes exactly. I don't. The next thing we'll look at is data organization and IO paths. And I think this is really interesting because what we're talking about here is how is the data placed? How does the metadata system work? How is it that we take an incoming block and turn it into something that's referenced on the array? Uh, Pure does a very different thing based on their architecture from Extreme IO and Solid Fire, and they use something called location addressing. And location addressing is really straightforward. We take the LBA range and we map it to a physical set of blocks. We map that to the location of the block data. We put that in a key value store, and that's our core mapping between where does something live and what is the ID of that block. Now, once we start throwing in dedupe and compression and lots of block metadata mappings, Pure has a couple different metadata structures that they're using. The first is called the link table, and the link table keeps track of any block that has multiple references. Right, so it's the, um, it's the how many times is this block referenced and where is it referenced from. The second is the dedupe table, and this is really an opportunistic uh, lookup tree. This is I want to create a quick and dirty, almost a cache of all of the blocks that are currently available on the array so that I can do a really quick dedupe check up front and be able to map that reference into the link table and move on. And then the last one is probably the most complicated because it's not really a table, it's more of a directed graph or tree walk. And where this gets used is keeping track of shared block ranges. So if I do a clone, if I do a snapshot, if I do an X copy, and I have an entire block of, or an entire range of blocks that I'm going to reference, I've got a table to be able to do that so that I'm not having to go through and update thousands or hundreds of thousands of individual entries in that link table. Now, the metadata itself gets stored in SSD and gets partially cached into memory. And the, really, the only reason that this is relevant at all is that there's an algorithm up front that's pre-caching the uh, metadata, and if anything misses that cache, it's gonna come out of SSD. Now, in the grand scheme of things, there's no performance overhead for this, realistically. Um, and it's not like we're putting additional wear onto the SSDs by having to do the metadata lookups. Um, but since it is different from how the other two products that we're talking about do it, uh, I wanna go ahead and put it in there. If we look at the IO paths, uh, this is where having visibility to all of the blocks from all of the controllers makes the I.O. path for uh, Pure pretty straightforward. When I want to read a block, I generate my list of LBA pairs, I go through all of my uh, metadata structures one at a time until I get to the answer. Right? I might have to just go through the link table, I might have to go through the link table and the dedupe table, I may have to go through all three of them. I'm going to get the physical location of that data, I'm going to read it and I'm going to return it to the user. So all I have to do is map what it was that I needed to the physical location on the drive, whether that's a real or referenced block and be able to return it back. On the right side, I'm going to bring all of those LBAs in and I'm gonna translate them into that medium table. And I'm gonna persist everything down to NVRAM. Right? And the NVRAM is going to have, uh, is, is basically my staging area before I write everything down to the SSD. Now, in my opinion, Pure makes a really good architectural choice here. They know that they have a fixed amount of CPU in every controller. They have a fixed amount of CPU in every cluster. The CPU is going to do both the data services and provide the I.O. And if 
an array gets into a completely ridiculous state, right? Something that Pure would certainly never advertise customers to do, where there's no I.O. available to do to the, the data services, it will prioritize the I.O. And it will actually write everything down into the data and metadata log, and the next time it goes through and does garbage collection, it will catch up on all of the deduplication. Right? So they're never going to get into a place where I can't write I.O. because I wasn't able to do my deduplication. And knowing the constraints that they had to work with with the two controllers, I don't know a single customer that would be upset with this. Right? And it's why um, EMC in particular made a lot of hay about this back when the pure arrays were new. It's mostly in line. It is usually in line. It's in Frankly, line it's in line when it can be. Right? And it should always be able to, you know, I've seen, I've seen one lab configuration where, where um, a customer was able to, as part of a POC, make it not be in line. And if any of you ever ran an array at that point, you deserve to go straight to jail. So, uh, you know, hey, the, that's what I do for a living. They, they do, uh, right, you're allowed to break them. <laughs> Customers, we tend to discourage. Um, and then it gets written down into the metadata log, and then they write that metadata into the pyramid at whichever stack of, uh, of metadata key value tables that makes sense. Right. Solid fire and extreme I.O., there is not a direct relationship between all of the controllers and all of the data. So rather than doing a location address, we're going to do a content address. And the volume metadata is a key value store where we're mapping those LBAs into a hash ID. Right? Solid fire calls that a block ID. I still haven't been able to figure out two years later what it is that Extreme IO calls that, um, but they have the same concept, and multiple keys can obviously point to the same content footprint. The block metadata then maps that block ID to a location of block data. If you want to think about this in a distributed environment, this is a two-step process. I map the block to a node, I map the node to a disk. Right, so I first send it to the node that's responsible for that volume, and then I map it from the node that's responsible to that volume down to the actual range of blocks that holds the data. All the metadata for both of these systems is stored on SSD, but it's kept 100% in memory at runtime. So no matter what metadata lookup or operation is happening, all of that happens in system DRAM. When we look at the data paths here, we've got that one extra hop in the middle. So we look up the block ID in, uh, in the metadata volume, we route that read request to the node that's responsible for the block ID. We then reference the block ID in the, meta in the block metadata. We read the block from SSD. In the case of SolidFire, we, we decompress that block and then we send it out to the user. On the right side, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna run the hash against it to, co to compute that block ID. We're gonna compress it. Again, on the SolidFire side, we're gonna store it in NVRAM. We're going to replicate it to a second NVRAM location, and at that point, it's data protected. We're going to acknowledge back to the host that it's been written. Okay, you, you left that step out in the pure, but they do that. Yes. Yes. The NVRAM to the other controller. Correct. Yeah. And w that's actually a change for them with the new uh, M series, because that, they didn't do that with the, with the old ones. So that's actually the introduction, the introduction of the NVRAM cards as their... Um, as their metadata, as their metadata and right. cache. Right, well, they didn't used to ha actually have Correct. NVRAM. They it called used to it be... NVRAM, but they were SSDs. Right, they were the, the EMLCs in slot 0 and 15. Uh, SLCs. Were they SLCs? Yeah, they were Zeus IOPS. So once we've written them to both of the NVRAM cards, we route that down to the node that's, respo node that's respo uh, responsible for the block ID. We check to see if that node or that block is deduped. If it is, we update the block metadata and we're done. Right. We'll talk a little bit about how that process of staging from NVRAM uh, for all of these companies down into disk happens here in just a second. So the difference between the two of these, location addressed is really going to be good for architectures where all the metadata and data is visible from all of the controllers. Right? And this fits the pure architectural model perfectly. It's really easy to see why that's the choice that they made. On the content address side, where we've got to map location to node and node to block, which is something important for both Extreme IO and Solid Fire, again, this is going to be best for distributed um, architectures and architectures where dedupe is part of the data path, right? where dedupe is not, you can't turn it off. Dedupe is actually part of what we go through before we place data on disk. If we talk about the data path, we then have to talk about how do we eliminate unreferenced data. And Pure uses, uh, this is the one place where all three companies are going to use a different process. Pure uses reference verification. So very straightforward because again, all of the blocks are seen from all of the controllers where Pure will go through during garbage collection, we'll just check to see uh, if all of the, block, the blocks that were originally written are still referenced. 
right? They look in the link table, they see if the block was overwritten, was it referenced from somewhere else and I need to keep it or not. They check that link table to make sure that there are not other, um, you know, fake blocks, deduplicated blocks that are pointing back to that original block. If there's no references that are found, it gets swept out um, and eliminated as part of garbage collection. So pretty straightforward. Does the block still exist? Do any links to the block still exist? Uh, recycle the block. Extreme IO uses reference counting. So every entry in that block metadata has a reference value. And that reference value increments every time a block is written again. So whether it's uh, you know, the first time it gets written down, it has an uh, increment of one. Every time it gets referenced as part of a, of a metadata transaction, that, uh, that count gets incremented. If the block gets overwritten, that count gets decremented. When the count hits zero, it gets eliminated from the system. Um, Operations that trigger huge data changes, so volume deletion, cloning, X copy, that would trigger lots and lots of uh, changes to those increments. Much like when we talked about uh, pure, you know, having multiple metadata tables means that I don't have to go update that original met metadata table as much if there's a large volume change. Um, Extreme IO is actually going to batch that up and run it as a background process. So if I do an X copy or if I do a volume deletion, rather than real time try to update that, um, that metadata count ID all of those different times across all of those different blocks, it'll batch it up and run it in the background. This is where you know, we, we talked about how the, the mostly inline was something that EMC threw at Pure. This is something um, that Pure throws at EMC, which is create a big volume, fill it with data, delete it, and watch how long it takes, right? And the reason that that is is because it's running as a background process so that it doesn't hammer the metadata in real time. And again, probably a good architectural decision um, for extreme I.O., but it's yeah, certainly one of those things. Takes, but I do care that the brick that knows that, that, meta, that those updates have to happen might fail before it finishes them. Correct. And is that batch incremental and stored somewhere that it can be restarted appropriately right. And again, these are not stupid people, right? I trust that that's been part of the, uh, the architectural process. But again, that's one of those reasons. They made an architectural decision based on what they wanted to impact and not impact. And you find one edge case that can be used against them and everybody throws it, it at It's them. not always edge cases, especially when you look at things like uh, VDI within a, a call center where every seven to eight hours, you are recycling large amounts of VMs yep. for the new staff that comes into play. Yep. And to that point, we've got a customer, a referenceable customer, Global Knowledge, who most of you know uh, does a bunch of the Cisco training. And that was the exact challenge that they were having, is that they build up a, a class, all of these VMs, all of these things, and then they blow away all of them. And the speed by which that deletion and rebuild happens was really important to them. Because it and affected their available capacity. Correct. And it affected how quickly they could spin up a class or refresh a class if something had to be changed. And um, you know they could either overbuild with all sorts of extra capacity right. or optimize for something that was going to clear that out faster. So not necessarily edge cases, but if I'm just running a general virtualization platform, maybe not something that is center of mind for me. SolidFire uses a process that we call mark and sweep garbage collection. Um, every entry in that block metadata, so the block ID to the location mapping, right, the second level mapping, uh, contains an in-use flag. And on a regular basis, we mark every block in there as not in use, right? We essentially color the entire board black. And then the volume metadata creates a bloom filter, so a really dense, really quick lookup table of all the blocks that are actually in use, and it goes through and colors all the blocks that are still in use white. The delta, anything that's still black, we go through and sweep as part of the garbage collection and recycling process. Where this is good is because we don't necessarily have only one source of truth for the metadata. We've got two copies of every block. So it's not just a is it in use or not, but it's an is it in use and where is my second copy of that block and which node does it live on and I need to make sure that both of those persist through every garbage collection cycle. So when we compare these together, the reference verification, again, if you've got an architecture where the metadata and data is globally available from all the controllers, path of least resistance, easy to implement. The reference counting is great from a speed standpoint, right? <coughs> the reference counting means that as soon as something happens and that reference count hits zero, the block is gone. Right? I didn't have to wait for a sweep. I just unreferenced it. I don't have to worry about it at all. The downside is it has to be perfect. 
that reference count must be 100% accurate for every block all the time, or you get all sorts of bad things. Because the reference count is, uh, for those of you who have any sort of electrical engineering background, you know, the reference count is your neutral. It is your zero. And if you start losing the reference count or the reference count is off, you don't know where the ground is anymore. Right? So it has to be perfect in order to be able to maintain the cache consistency and maintain the metadata consistency across it. When it's perfect, it's near instant. The market, the market sweep is great for loosely coupled systems. It's great for where there is no single source of truth for the metadata because the metadata is distributed across all of them. It requires a background sweep process, but it's very tolerant of system disruption. If a node disappears, if a disk disappears, that doesn't necessarily impact the ability for the metadata changes and the metadata tracking to, be, to stay consistent. The second part of, of Howard's point is once we know how it is that we're doing the data path, then it becomes how are we storing that I.O. onto the individual blocks. Uh, Extreme I.O. does a very clean and elegant uh, process for fixed block data layout. They take all of the drives in a shelf and they chunk up each of those drives into 4K blocks. They are perfectly similarly sized Lego pieces. Every one of these gets written out, and as data comes in, it gets broken up into these 4K blocks, and it gets dropped randomly across all of the shelves on the, uh, on the cluster um, into one of these 4K containers, one of these 4K chunks that's in there. Um, on the front end or on the block size? That's a good question. That's a good question. I'll check that. I'm, I'm pretty sure they... Um, whether it's 4K or 8K... The, the, the basic process remains the same, but yeah. I'll, I will definitely check the number there. Um, once each drive is fully written, any partial stripes get updated in place with new data, right? So they're not picking any old data up and moving it. Once the data gets written, it never gets moved again. Any holes, any 4K blocks that are opened up because of an overwrite or because that increment hit zero and we swept it away gets filled with the next 4K block that comes in and their algorithm distributes those across the entire array. Pure and solid fire use a log structured environment uh, where we take the SSD and we divide it up into fixed segments, uh, fixed size segments. These segments are typically the bin size of the NAND, right? We want to fill the SSD as cleanly and sequentially as we can. In the case of solid fire, that's a one meg chunk of data that we're going to write into. The incoming data gets aggregated, so all of the writes, regardless of size, get aggregated into these one meg chunks and then get laid down sequentially onto the disk. Once the drive is full, there's a recycling process that essentially reads ahead of where it is that we're writing, picks those blocks up, reconcatenates them into a one meg chunk, and lays them down sequentially. So every write to the drive will always be in order will always be from beginning to end and will always be sequentially in one meg chunks. So the question is, why does that matter? Uh, Dave Wright actually did the benchmarking here and it's amazing how well this has held up over the last two years. What we have here is a CMLC drive where we are blasting it with as many 128K random writes as we can. That's a good drive. Um, and then we're trying to see how many read, ops we, read IOPS we can get out of it. Oh, those are reads. Right? So what we've got here is a brand new out of the box drive. Everything's hunky dory. What happens, Howard? If you wrote to all the flash once and now you got a garbage collection. Garbage collection kicks in, right? Garbage collection loads itself out. And then after about an hour and 15 minutes, we get a nice steady 200 or 2,500 IOPS, which is not going to be sustainable for anything. And we get a fairly wide spread of latency within that IOPS, right? So this is what happens if I just blast writes across an SSD. Now, what happens if I make the writes bigger? If instead of 128K writes, I do one meg random writes, again, I still see my fall off as garbage collection. I hit garbage collection much faster. I still see the fall off as I go. And what I'm gonna get is more IOPS, right? I'm going to get more IOPS just because I have one meg pieces that I'm writing down. My latency is all over the place. Yeah, the individual garbage collections are catching you. Are catching you every time you fill up whatever the buffer is on the drive, right? Now, what if I take those one meg random writes and make them one meg sequential writes? The first thing that we see is that garbage collection very quickly gets out of your way because there's really nothing to collect. Right? We're writing and recomposting and writing sequentially onto the drive. There's really no holes that garbage collection needs to fill in from an individual drive standpoint. 
So what we get is both a significant amount more IOPS out of the exact same CMLC drive. More importantly to me is that we get a fantastic latency uh, tightening across all of those individual reads. Right? So by changing how it is that we binned up that data and wrote it down to the SSD, we've really changed the performance characteristics and the write endurance of the SSD. Now, knowing that this is the case, one would ask, why would I use 4K or 8K blocks of data and write them randomly across all of the drives? <coughs> the answer is the drive that Extreme IO originally used was from a company called Anabit. And this is a spectacular SSD. Spectacular controller, spectacular amount of over-provisioning. And then this, Apple bought them and took it off the market. This, this was the cat's ass right here. Right? And what we see is that even with the 128K <laughs> random writes, I'm getting 50, greater than 15,000 IOPS and a real pretty latency curve. The downside, as Howard pointed out, is that Apple really liked this too and just bought the whole damn company. Right? So what we know is that it took a little while for Extreme IO to find another drive that would give them similar characteristics. The last time I checked, it was still a Hitachi drive that they were using, EMLC drive that they were using in the background. My assumption is they're getting the, the, the same amount of IOPS, but this is, why, this is why Extreme IO can tout we don't do any system level garbage collection. They don't have to. They're pushing all of that down to the individual drive and letting the drive do it. Not good or bad or better or worse, the same process has to happen. It's just happening at a different level of processing, right? Whether it's the system they're, back they're or whether it's the money drive on back. SSD controllers instead, instead of, of Xeons in the right. up controller upstream. But if they're storing metadata in DRAM, it means that they don't have to spend any DRAM on system garbage collection. Again, that's the trade off that they're making in the architecture. So the differences between fixed block and log structure uh, fixed block is great for simpler fire, file systems, especially when you're using the EMLC SSDs. Right? I, I map out my blocks, I fill my blocks, I never have to move data after, I put them on my blocks, I minimize my write, um, my, my uh, drive wear by knowing that I'm never gonna have to move data once it gets written down to the SSD. On the log structured size, this is where uh, we get lots of easy support for variable block sizes. One of the reasons that Extreme IO struggles with compression is because every block is the same size. How do I compress a block and then fit it into a space that is the same size as every other block? Do I split them up and then store them somewhere and concatenate two 4Ks together into an 8K and write it down? It just gets more complex. Well, you, take, you take a 64K and you compress it down into how many 4Ks it adds up to. And then you have to figure out how to split it and reference it in and metadata. And, and it's, yeah. Right, right. It's it not impossible, a lot more complex to do variable block size. And on the fixed block size, we're right fragmenting. We're taking whatever comes in and we're breaking it down into whatever size chunk it is that we're writing it to on the SSD. On the log structured side, I'm coalescing those. Whatever those right sizes are, no matter how big that I.O. is, I'm going to block that out into one meg chunks and lay it down. So I'm limiting my drive wear by being very prescriptive about how I lay data down on the SSD, not by fixing the SSD into blocks that I don't have to move again. The last one that we're going to look at, and we're doing pretty good here, the last one we're going to look at is uh, power loss protection. And this was also an interesting one uh, because each of the, the companies did it a little bit differently. Uh, not at all. This was the original, and this is funny, um, uh, we actually, I went through and edited this for the Insight event and the presentation version that I gave to Tom still had the old one. Uh, in 2014, what Pure did was they had mirrored SLC SSDs. And so the first drive and the last drive in the first shelf was where all of the data and metadata updates came into. It got written to both of them, it got acknowledged back, and then it got written down to from there. Um, Pure actually changed this with the M-series arrays that they put out, and they replaced the, um, the, those uh, uh, SLC drives with PCIe cards, right? So this is where uh, Pure was originally, and now it looks a lot more like what SolidFire is doing with the PCIe cards in there. Um, yeah, before Are we send sure this one out. Because the M has four slots for NVMe on the front. Yes. Actually, all their slots are NVMe. They've got four slots for Especially above. The, the NVRAM NVMe cards that Correct. they make. That make that cache. So Extreme I.O. does it in system DRAM. Um, and this is both a joy and a pain. 
right? The joy is that it's blazingly fast. Right. They have nothing to traverse. It's system memory. Um, the, the work that they're doing in there with metadata caching, with metadata response time, with block tracking is going to be extraordinarily fast. Um, the downside is that today, we don't have any sort of persistence on the system memory. If the box goes down, everything that was in system memory goes away. If those are uncommitted to disk, you have a problem, right? You can never lose power to the system memory. And Extreme IO fixes this in the, in the, the path of least resistance method of just always making sure there's power in the cabinet. So there are multiple UPS systems that live with each of those arrays, right? My expectation is that when we get to a place where we have power persistence on system memory, the requirement for those UPSs will go away for extreme I.O. One should only hope. One should only hope. No reason that they couldn't. Um, on power loss, all of that dirty data gets flushed to the disk shelf or to the internal controller SSD, and then they stage the power down of the actual arrays using the, um, using the UPSs that are in the cabinet. Okay, you didn't mention that the advantage that, yeah, one more back. Since, right, since it's not SSDs, since Pure's cache is accessible to both controllers. They don't have all the overhead of doing cache consistency yes. that Extreme I.O. does. Correct. Correct. And that, um, you know, in the, in the uh, Pure arrays, it's NVMe, I, I believe. Yeah, in the, NVMe, NVRAM. In the, in the solid fire arrays, it's PCIe, NVRAM. Yeah. Uh, the general mechanism is roughly the same in that each node or controller has its own independent uh, NVRAM source. The NVRAM typically has some sort of local DRAM, has some sort of supercapacitor, um, and then has the SLC, the, the, the power, can, you know, the, the, the power protected, yeah. right? And then all of the data and metadata rights are committed to multiple NVRAM cards, right? Both of the, um, both of the NVRAM instances before it's acknowledged back to the user. So if the power fails, using the supercapacitor, it's gonna flush everything out of the DRAM down into the SLC flash that's on that NVRAM card. Right? And then when the array comes back up, anything that's stored in the NVRAM card gets committed out to disk the same way it would have had the power stayed on. Yeah, minor point. Sure. Your multiple NVRAM cards, mm -hmm. true for you, but not for them. Uh, so they've got two, one per controller. No, they've got two that are dual port NVMe, both accessible to both controllers. Excellent. Follow up with me afterwards, yeah. and we'll update the slide. Thank you. So when we look at these, um, you know, on one hand, we've got something that is the highest throughput and the lowest latency. System DRAM is always going to be the fastest storage um, on the server, uh, at least in the controllers that we're looking at today. The data is protected from single point of failure. Uh, the only risk to system memory would be some sort of kernel panic, but there are two system controllers, so the idea that there would be a storage kernel panic, uh, software kernel panic on both controllers at the same time that would flush system memory at the same time is, is fairly small. Uh, very simple implementation here, right? Power can never go down, let's bring our own power to the table. On the NVRAM side, we get high throughput, uh, low latency, not, certainly not as fast as the system memory. We're protected from that single point of failure. It's out of the software path. So on both the pure side and the solid fire side, if something happens to the storage software and we need to restart a controller, we're not going to impact any of the data that's been written to cache uh, and pretty low maintenance. These are fairly static cards. There's not a whole lot of moving parts. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look best here uh, at the higher, higher levels of protection, being able to make sure that that cache is always available. Um, this is one uh, that, looks, uh, that looks really the same as when we did this the first time. And what we did here was we looked at four things that we thought customers were looking at as important in all flash arrays. When we talk to customers about doing POCs or doing comparisons, we encourage them to build their own list of the things that are important to them and then go through the architectures and find out where they match up. What we can see is if we look at best for scale, time to market, cost, and availability is a priority list that matches really well with what we know these three companies wanted. I mean, specifically in the case of Solid Fire, scale and availability were absolutely our top two priorities. And being able to use the CMLC to bring the cost of that platform in line, knowing that it was always going to be all flash, uh, was certainly high on the list. And when we look at the Pure and Extreme IO, they got these products to market extraordinarily fast. Right? On purpose, that's what they wanted to do. They did a great job at it. And then start to, to address um, availability and cost. 
on the pure side, which very much matches up with what their customers uh, like about the platforms that they have, and then trying to uh, prioritize the scale side, being able to add multiple experts into a single cluster. Right? So the architectural choices that were made very much match up to the implementation and operational posture of those arrays, very much matches up to the market that those companies are trying to uh, target with those arrays. Right? So the, the, the proof point of the choices that they make is how well do they serve the priorities that they were trying to with the platform. This slide, uh, I edited and added after Dave Hitz's uh, you know, cable-defined storage discussion that he had uh, with Dave Wright on stage here a few days ago. Um, the architectural choices you make as a storage company lots of times manifest themselves internal to the product and internal to what guts can I use and how do I cache and you know, how, where do I send, spend my CPU budget on the things that I need to do. Sometimes those architectural choices show up in the physical implementation. And the, the node-based approach that SolidFire took, we wanted to be able to streamline the implementation, physical implementation of that as much as possible. And saying, here's the most boring x86 1U platform in the history of the world, and here are the four cables that I need to come out the back of it. Um, everything else we'll take care of in software. Right? The clustering, the availability, all of the rest of that we'll take care of in software. Um, you know, versus we want to be fast to market, we want to do scale in a particular way, we want to do the block layout in a particular way where the... And they, and they wanted to support fiber channel. And they, they wanted to support fiber channel, they wanted a low latency network that connected all of the controllers to the arrays. None of these bad things... No, but because they had to support fiber channel and you couldn't do a redirect, they needed the low latency Correct. network on the back end. Yep. And so again, not a, not a good choice or a bad choice, just a different choice. This is one that tends to show itself in the physical implementation and how it gets racked and how it gets cabled. So sometimes these things are, uh, you know, they're the nerd knobs that everybody in this room loves. Sometimes they're very apparent to customers who are implementing things how those choices ended up manifesting themselves. They send an SE, he connects all the cables, why do I care? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Because when you got to troubleshoot, then they got to send out another SE. I'm pretty sure you could handle the solid fire cluster by yourself. So the solid fire platform that we built, we're very proud of it. We're proud of the architecture. We're proud of the success that we've had with customers. Um, as part of the NetApp portfolio, we're really excited to see the way that we can help customers and customer personas be able to consume storage differently, be able to manage storage differently, and our ability to do that is very much a result of the architectural choices that we made as we went through here. So thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. If there are any questions or if anyone watching online uh, wants a deeper dive into the SolidFire technologies, please feel free to reach out.